Welcome to another episode of Good Value by Antipodes. It was the reopening many investors thought could bring a spectacular stock market resurgence. But the interest in Chinese equities following the end of the COVID-19 lockdowns has faded. The domestic recovery has been slower than expected, and exports, well, they continue to be weighed down by the economic deterioration in the West. So how should investors respond to this China stock market stalemate? Well, I've got someone who's promised me all the answers, and that's John Stavliotis, Portfolio Manager of the Antipodes Emerging Markets Fund. Hi, John. Hi, Alison. Um, It's good to be back on the Good Value podcast. I think it's been six months, and as you said, a lot's happened, but we've still got a lot of questions to go through, don't we? (laughs) We sure do. Now, you actually just got back from a research trip in China. And while you were away, you sent the team some notes internally. And one thing that you did say was that foreign sentiment remains quite weak. So can you explain what you saw? Yeah, yeah. So look, the first thing to start with is is COVID is over. People are moving about. Um, There's a real sense of a return to normality. Um, But yeah, your point about sentiment was actually really interesting. Um, there was just a lack of foreign investors around. So I joined an EV battery tour, which I think EVs is probably one of the um, most topical investment themes for, for this year globally. Um, and that tour was organised by Morgan Stanley. They, they had capacity for 20 people. There was only 10 at any one point. And I was actually the only investor that was representing a fund that was not China only. So, so I thought that was a good... Um, you know, example of the negative sentiment, uh, p- particularly by international investors in China. And I guess that goes some way to explaining what we are seeing when it comes to Chinese equities. There was a surge in interest in Chinese companies, but a lot of that price performance has been given back on concern around the pace of recovery. Can you take us through what you're seeing? Yeah, sure. So, so what happened was you had the, the big bang reopening and and the economy and really picked up quite quickly. We had a very strong Chinese New Year and, and post-New Year recovery. Um, but then going into Q2, you sort of did have a bit of weakness uh, and, and really it, more weaker than what we had expected. But if you sort of look at it from a higher level, you, you'd think, right, we'd A lot of people were expecting that hockey stick recovery that we saw in the US. And the reality is China just has not had that level of of, um, stimulus, particularly in in the form of just cash handouts. Um, So that that expectation probably was a bit too high generally by the market. Um, Manufacturing has been choppy. You know, that's that's exports weakening more recently. Um, But generally services have been quite strong. That's been the bright spot particularly if you look at the bottom end of consumption and the top end of consumption have been has been actually very strong and a bit mixed in the midpoint. So I guess how we look at it is we think this is an ex- a more normal exit of from a recession rather than this, you know, cash handout fueled hockey stick. Um, and, and really it's going to be a non-linear sort of recovery. And so what are the key things holding back the economy? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think this is really important, right? Because looking at the Chinese economy, you need to really have a dynamic view at the moment, given a lot of the big swings in, in um, activity that have happened in the last 12 months and, and big shifts in, um, in, um, in sentiment, etc. And, and in terms of what's holding it back, it's property is the first thing I'd like to sort of mention. And we, we think that there's going to be a drag that's going to remain for the coming two years. And that's because of an L-shaped type of recovery. So to sort of delve into that, at the peak, you had 16 million units completing per year, which is a pretty pretty big number, right? That's like 1.4 times Australia's housing stock. That went down to 14 million. Last year, it dropped to 9 million. We, we've done a lot of work around natural demand in China, and we think it's about 10 to 12 million, which, which itself is an important point, right? Because you've still got a lot of demand from uh, urbanisation. The, the urbanisation rate in China is 65% at the moment. Um, and there's targets to get that back to 75%. If you think of Japan in 1990, their urbanisation rate was already at 75%. Um, so th- 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 we think that there is quite a bit of runway to go at that sort of 10 to 12 million. But 10 to 12 million is a lot less than the levels we were seeing in 2021. So we think that there's a couple of years to work through this excess inventory. 
wh- one thing that was obvious from our trip was if you go to a city where the property market is actually quite normal, as in not too much inventory, that city is actually booming. And then if you go where there's a problem, the opposite is happening. So one of the things we're doing post this trip is looking at that inventory at a city level. And like one of the first data points I can sort of share now is if you kind of look at the top 80 cities and you measure which of those have an inventory problem, which we define as inventory over one standard deviation above the 10-year average, that that percentage of problem cities has reduced from 60% in November to 30% in April. That's a marked improvement, but there's more to come, right? There's more to go. So that's something that, that we're, um, we're watching for very closely. Um, the, the second point, I think, when you ask about what's causing this sort of Q2 slowdown, I think it's about the employment recovery. So one of the big numbers that people talk about is youth unemployment being circa 20%, um, which, which is very high. Some of the feedback, this is a key thing we're trying to get feedback on on the ground, and it's a lot of the youth move back home during COVID. And, you know, I can't think of a better way to put it, but they're still sponging off their parents, even though we've gone into reopening. And they're waiting to get that job, that dream job that they want. The reality is I don't think... Um, China is rich enough yet that these people can do this forever, that they will have to settle for something that is in their field, but maybe not the, the best job that, that they originally wanted. Um, so that, that'll come with time. And then the other point is SMEs make up um, 80% of job creation. SMEs take time to recover. So, th- so this is things that we're watching um, to, to see the continued recovery in the coming months. Um, and, and really to test our view constantly to ensure that we're not missing something getting worse. And do you think we will see a policy response from the central government? Yes. Yeah, so, so if you look, China's, China policymakers have got meaningful firepower to stimulate, right? Inflation is not a problem. The April number was 0.1%. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of reason given, you know, a view that growth is probably lower than it has been in the past will mean that there is... Um, you know, inflation is likely to remain lower. Um, Policies around stimulating consumption or investment could really change the picture in China. It could really, you know, bring forward this recovery that that we're saying is going to be somewhat slower out of this recession. Uh, And they're increasingly being pushed into this direction, especially if the global economy continues to weaken, because that'll keep putting pressure on exports. Um, but yeah, on the flip side, without more support, and if the data remains weak, um, that would be a negative. So, so we see um, a potential catalyst on this front at the Politburo meeting uh, in July, where um, these sort of discussions happened. And, and our view is that policy will be targeted. So going back to that top 80 cities analysis, it'll be targeted to fix the problem where, you know, inventory is too high or local government debt is too high rather than this blanket you know bazooka type of stimulus that we've seen in China in the past. Um, wh- one of the things that's worth mentioning which gets a lot of sort of discussion is regulation related to policy. Um, historically China has used regulation to sort of modernize and develop industries right but They've typically done that in periods of economic strength such that the regulation doesn't push the economy um, further down, I guess, into a slowdown. So so we don't see this as a period where we should expect excess regulation. And and this has been the message from the government um, over over the last year. Um, So so in that sense, we think policy will will remain a tailwind um, in the near future. So it sounds like stimulus may drive the post-COVID recovery and certainly help clear inventory in those cities that you just mentioned. But property won't be the same growth driver as it was in the past. And and as you just called out, the infrastructure lever hasn't been pulled to the same extent as it once was. So how are you thinking about the longer-term growth profile of the Chinese economy? Yeah, so, so we estimate that property was a major drag. So, and, and this is really based on um, very back-of-the-envelope type of analysis. If you think about new starts being down 40%, uh, 
Um, and the fact that the construction impact um, will occur over a sort of three-year period. So you think of a new a new start takes two to three years to build. Hence, it will take three years for that re- you know slow down in construction to to come through into the economy. We, we estimate they could have shaved off about five percentage points off GDP growth in two thousand and twenty-two, um, wh- which is a very meaningful figure. And the drag will remain into. 2023 at a lower level and then slightly less so into 24 and at that point we think property is um will no longer be a drag in in the near term um beyond that point we think of other issues such as demographics and aging population will also you know hold back growth from the prior levels of circa eight percent so we think you know you should be thinking of china gdp growth in the range of four to five percent um, going forward, you know, that, that is still well above many advanced economies. And, you know, given what's being priced in Chinese equities at the moment, we, th- we think that an outcome of 4 to 5% is actually pretty positive from a re-rating perspective, um, you know, b- based on where these stocks are currently trading. In terms of where does this growth come from, right? Well, I've just mentioned what a sensitivity to property is, but the, the drivers going forward, we think, really are around, firstly, consumption. China has got, you know, very well reported, a very high um, savings rate. And as, um, you know, social safety net improves in the country, you're going to see people allocate more of their incremental income towards consumption rather than savings. Um, infrastructure, we think, will remain a driver, potentially less so as it shifts more towards grid and um, renewables instead of the old sort of building roads and bridges that um, was the driver in the past. Um, and, and as a whole, the structural view on China, as, as I've sort of alluded to, has deteriorated. Um, but there are very interesting pockets of structural opportunities in China that are going to drive GDP growth and will present really interesting investment opportunities, we think. So what is an example of a structural opportunity in China? Yeah, so I think an example is in manufacturing. So this is a topic, you know, given the US nearshoring, onshoring um, and just rising wages in China, most people think of manufacturing from the perspective of a drag. Um, What we're actually seeing in China is China is moving downstream and we're moving from what I would, you know, what we used to call made in China by foreign enterprises Now it's actually made by China. Um, You know, an interesting statistic is the share of exports from China that from a foreign um, enterprise used to be in the order of 65% or so back in 2005. That number has dropped to the mid-30s. So that means two-thirds of exports are basically controlled or, you know, the IP is owned by a Chinese company. Um, And, you know, I'll give you an example the iPhone 14, um, circa one quarter of the materials of an iPhone 14 um, comes from, uh, or, or the IP is owned by a Chinese a Chinese firm. For example, the camera um, the camera on iPhone is made by actually Taiwanese and also Chinese companies, um, and th- this is a marked change from let's say 10 years ago or 2010. The iPhone 4 only three percent. Um, came from China, and this mainly related to assembly. So we've actually seen many of these Chinese companies now export um, to low-wage countries in Southeast Asia for final assembly, Um, and we can see that in the data that growth in exports to Southeast Asia have been quite strong, Um, but they're actually maintaining um, or or continue to generate value from the supply chain in in owning the high-value components of that manufacturing. Another example, sort of moving even further downstream, um, is the example where they own the final IP or brand in the example of electric vehicles. Um, A number of electric vehicle brands in China have developed over the last, you know, 10 plus years and a lot more more recently, but BYD is the best example. And they're quickly catching up to Tesla to be the largest producer of battery electric vehicles in the world. This year, they're forecast to sell 1.5 million vehicles. That compares to Tesla, which is forecast to sell 1.8 million vehicles. 
Um, and I'm sure, you know, if you're based in Australia, you would see a lot of BYDs going around. Um, I got an Uber the other day and it was a BYD. Um, so, and the other interesting point I do like to make is they're actually the ones that are bringing EVs to the masses. If you look, they've just released a car in China that sells for 11,000 US dollars that has a range of over 400 kilometres. Um, and interesting, China is now the largest exporter of vehicles by volume um, globally. So this is another example of that moving downstream and the value created within the manufacturing and supply chain um, industry. Now, a conversation on China isn't complete without touching on geopolitics. How important is geopolitics in the bigger picture for Chinese stocks? We know that tensions between the US and China aren't improving, but the market has priced China to be the loser in this battle of the two superpowers. But can the West really decouple from China? And is the outcome as binary as this in a world that is becoming more multipolar? Yeah, yeah. So this is a really interesting topic that, you know, you, you, like you said, you can't talk about China without going into geopolitics. Um, so there's a lot of talk about, you know, the, the new Cold War of China and, and US, but th there's a big difference now. And the global economy is more integrated than ever. And China contributes 15% of global trade. Any strategy to cut China out of the developed world is going to be very costly and very difficult. So... You know, we think the US will continue to push towards onshoring supply chains, um, moving manufacturing to places nearby like Mexico. Um, but the high cost of doing this is likely to limit this to really leading edge semiconductors and other strategic technologies, especially where it, where it aids military and other security ambitions. So, you know, what I'm saying there is I don't expect US to bring the manufacturing of aircons onshore, right? Um, and the other way, to th the other thing to think about is the rising the rise of China's manufacturing technology leadership doesn't necessarily threaten the power of the U.S., but it does create an alternative for the rest of the world. Um, so while China and the U.S. may be decoupling from each other, they're going to remain highly coupled to the rest of the world, with China positioned to take market share in a multipolar world. And who is China turning to? You, well, yeah, if you, if you look at the statistics, it's, it's been for some time that China is looking towards the developing world across Asia, LATAM, Africa, Russia, Middle East um, f for geopolitically aligned partners. Exports to these developing world partners have increased by 13 percentage points to 44% of China's exports over the last decades. In that same period, exports to the or the share of exports to the US has fallen from 18% down to 16. That, that is a, that's a quite a large shift that's happened in the composition of exports from China. And what's really interesting is the developing world now accounts for more than 40% of total GDP um, and, and a much larger number of population. Um, well, this represents a, a material demand opportunity for China, but it also shows that the US is at risk of losing influence. Um, furthermore, recent actions by the West, when you think of situations such as freezing Russia's FX, you know, technological embargo on China, it's actually spooking many non-aligned countries into being more open to hedging their bets as the US-China chess game plays out. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quick little example of that is just the use of RMB in trade now. We're hearing about the Saudi um, oil um, trade happening in RMB. There was discussion from President Lula from Brazil of, you know, discussion of using RMB in their trade or why we're we using US dollars. And, and that goes beyond just, you know, this power of this block, this emerging market block, but also in that the US dollar's role as as the global reserve currency is starting to be challenged somewhat given the inflation that we saw in the US, the you know fiscal spending um, and the amount of quantitative easing over the last decades, it's really starting to ch challenge that view. Now, I, d I, don't want to, I don't want to leave you thinking that the US dollar will be challenged, but th this is an interesting, um, you know, another interesting story in this um, exchange between the, the multipolar world, right? Um, 
so I, I th- I'd, the other thing we should really consider is what's the risk to this view? Because we're taking the approach that pragmatism will prevail amongst leading world powers, which doesn't always happen. So, you know, what we're watching is communication lines between the US and China. This is a classical case of prisoner's dilemma, in my view. And without communication, both sides are just fearing of what the other is scheming. And this can easily sort of get out of control. So that's why, you know, examples of now China and the US starting to communicate again. There was an article that Blinken may potentially be travelling to China. G20 is coming up. These are all very important events um, to watch in this geopolitical um, relationship. Okay, let's bring it back to the investment opportunity. Chinese stocks are priced at 12 times forward earnings, which is around a 20% discount to the historical average of 15 times. Earnings in the region have been through a downgrade cycle over the last two years, given the weak domestic economy. And when you look at analyst forecasts, China is the only major economic bloc that is expected to see earnings grow over the next 12 months. So I guess, John, the question is, is the multiple attractive enough to compensate for uncertainty in China? Yeah, we think it is. So if you look at Chinese equities listed offshore, they're priced at the largest implied discount to world PE since 2000. If China GDP can grow at 4 to 5%, this relative discount is just too wide. Now, if you kind of look of who's the incremental buyer to sort of drive this sort of re-rating, we, we sort of look at it from two frames. Firstly, looking at it from internal, the onshore in, um, investor in China, China's capital controls are unlikely to change anytime soon. And with the property market outlook not being as strong, there is a chance that we see, you know, a shift towards a higher allocation to equities um, within China, which currently um, sit at a lower percentage of financial asset composition relative to similar countries. Cash represents over 50% of household financial assets at the moment. This will be a big driver, and we think especially for these you know, opportunistic structural stories where a scarcity value as there are fewer of these sort of structural growth stories in China should drive valuations higher as as we've seen in other markets. If we look out outward in foreign investors looking at China, China is, is very underrepresented in global indices. If you look at the MSCI ACWI, China's weight is 4%, whereas if you just use the total market cap of all companies globally, China would represent 16%. If you use GDP, it would represent around 19% um, and similar for population. If you then add EM, um, it, it's, a, it's an even bigger dislocation. EM is about circa 10% of MSCI ACWI um, and a far greater weight of, of GDP. So we, we just think that globally investors, despite further than just the sentiment, they're structurally underweight these markets. And... As these structural um, growth companies, you know, deliver on on their opportunity over time, we think that more capital from foreign markets can be attracted to these businesses that will drive a re-rating and share prices higher. Now, John, I want to spend the last 10 minutes or so looking at three interesting ideas when it comes to China. Let's start with Medea, which is a core holding across the global and emerging markets portfolios at Antipodes. And we touched on this company with Jacob Mitchell in last month's episode. Medea is a dominant air conditioning manufacturer in China, and its global market share is equal to that of the Japanese manufacturer Daikin. How do valuations between the two global leaders compare? So, so very simply, you can buy Medea, which is growing at circa 10% um, plus today on 12 times earnings, while Daikin, which is growing at you know, single digits levels is priced at 25 times earnings. So for Medea, the efficient cost structure and investment and distribution has allowed them to price competitively and grow market share both domestically and overseas. Now, over half of these exports are to emerging markets. This is an example where Chinese IP, it's really creating products that are very well suited to that, you know, cost conscious customer that is located in emerging markets. Um, 
So, and, and these markets have got a high growth trajectory, right? Especially in something like air conditioning, where penetration and upgrades are, and, and you know, lower energy intensive units, these are thematics that will drive growth over the long term. Um, closer to home, Medea will be benefiting from stabilization in the Chinese property market. Um, but I just want to point out, it's not reliant on a large increase in new starts. It's more about replacement and secondary transactions. As in China, mostly most people, when they buy a, a home on the secondary market, they will typically renovate, um, and that may include a, a new air conditioner. Um, building on its, its success in air cons and its sort of leadership in manufacturing, the, the group has acquired a robotics business called KUKA, um, based in Germany, back in 2017. Uh, and... Its investment in industrial automation and robotics, it, it leverages this manufacturing experience that it's got. Um, and they're very good at innovating with these products. So we think this could be a longer term growth driver, but you know, it's more of a, a blue sky opportunity for this stock rather than being a key driver for the next five years earnings. So, so this is a stock we really like. And as you said, we, it, it's a core holding across our portfolios. Okay, the second stock I wanted to talk about today is EV battery maker CATL. We've spoken about EVs throughout our conversation already, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but this company manufactures more than a third of all EV batteries globally, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, that's right. CATL is, is the largest battery maker, EV battery maker in the world, with, as you said, one third of all vehicles, but that's driven by their 50% share in China. They've really maintained that share despite very tense, intense competition because of their ability to have 10% higher energy density compared to the equivalents from peers. This performance gap has actually widened in each of the last three years. The other interesting thing with this company, it's got the broadest portfolio of OEM relationships um, amongst all the battery makers. And there's a really interesting little anecdote which I think we should talk about with CATL is Ford and Tesla in the US have both tried to or have both announced JV partnerships with CATL. Now that's quite controversial because of the Inflation Reduction Act um, stimulus that's been given in the US limits you know limits these companies from using parts suppliers and other suppliers from China. The fact that they've chosen CATL actually gives you quite conf gives you some confidence about the, their ability as a, as a battery maker, um, the fact that they have a, have a differentiation in, in being able to produce LFP batteries, which is a type of cheaper batteries that will be used in lower value mass market vehicles that the Korean battery makers just can't match them on. Um, so, so, and another in interesting point on this is Tesla just recently announced that all of their Model 3 vehicles in the US are eligible for the stimulus package. And that's despite um, about a third of them actually using batteries, uh, battery cells sourced from CATL. So that's an example where even with this IRA stimulus, there are ways to work around that for leading companies um, like, like CATL. Um, so if you think of the long-term opportunity, we think that LFP battery, which is what I mentioned, that cheaper um, battery alternative, is, is required for, for EV penetration to to increase for the masses, for the mass market vehicles. Um, this will be a key driver as more of the global brands start to adopt this technology, we think that positions this company as a leader. The stock's trading on 23 times current year PE um, and there's circa 20% growth in revenue per annum over the next three years on what I think are fairly conservative assumptions, particularly assuming not many sales in the US despite evidence recently that they are generating sales there. Um, so we think that presents attractive value for a company that's got such a strong position in a very high growth industry. And just to give some context to that valuation, CATL is a fair bit cheaper than the Korean battery makers, isn't it, John? Yeah, that's right. So Korean company LG Energy, um, they've got a 13% share of global EV battery market, high single digit ROC, and it's priced at 67 times earnings. And a lot of that's because people are assuming a lot of those funds from the Inflation Reduction Act are basically going to allow this company to generate pretty high returns in the future. And for our final stock, let's change tack and discuss Galaxy Entertainment, which is the leading integrated resort operator in Macau. 
It's not an emerging multinational like the prior two stocks we've discussed, but it is a core holding in the portfolios. Why do you like Galaxy given the uncertainty in the economic recovery? Well, two things have happened over the COVID period which make investing in Macau a lot more interesting. Firstly, the licences, this is a regulated industry, have been extended for 10 years. And then secondly, junket business, and these were external companies that basically helped wealthy Chinese bypass capital controls. These junkets have declined to zero uh, and is no longer a headwind. This is a, a segment of the market that had been, you know, the regulators had been trying to eliminate for a long period and COVID helped them basically take them out of the market. So that's a major positive, a headwind removed. Um, and Macau's an attractive opportunity because there'll be no new gaming tables approved. There are only six license holders that can operate in the region and no new licenses will be issued. Um, and our recent meetings show a focus on RE, which along with these regulatory limitations will, encha- will ensure supply remains constrained in the future. There's significant pent up demand and, and, that's, that's ref- um, and that's reflected in the sharp improvement we've seen in the numbers Um, especially when when we compare it to other consumption categories. So, for example, mass gambling activity over the May holiday period was back to pre-COVID levels. Um, And, you know, when when you think of the sustainability of Macau in general, there uh, there is a big improvement in the non-gaming facilities and that's attracting a broader customer base. But importantly, the gamblers are still coming. Um, so we visited Macau on this recent trip and uh, I'll, I will say some of these non-gambling facilities are actually looking r- really interesting. So you, you can see how you can now make a visit to Macau um, you know, for more than just, more than just um, hitting the tables, I guess, to, to put it that way. Um, so, so now with the junket operators gone, um, earnings margins are much higher. Um, so we expect the company can hit pre-COVID earnings run rate by the end of this year despite that VIP revenue effectively being eliminated or materially um, impaired. So we like Galaxy specifically because they have the biggest development pipeline of hotels over the next three years with very little other completions coming online from other operators. And that should see Galaxy's share grow from the current 18% that they had last quarter. This stock is trading on 13 times next year EV to EBITDA which is lower than pre-COVID, despite the structural opportunity looking better, as I mentioned, and also the growth profile being much stronger with this big, you know, development completions in hotels coming. Thanks for joining me today, John. At the outset, we promised investors you'd give us all the answers on China, and you've certainly given us a lot to think about. If I had to pick one comment that really stuck out for me during our conversation, it was that China accounts for 16% of world GDP, but still only 4% of the global equity index, which is quite remarkable. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, right? Especially if you look at the total market cap as well, that there are a lot of listed securities in China. And um, so it's not, it's not 4% because of a lack of options, right? So there is a catalyst there for that to increase. But yeah, Alison, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk through it. And I do hope that I answered all the questions. There's no denying there is uncertainty around the pace of economic recovery and geopolitics. But the valuation of Chinese equities accounts for these risks. And when the market is worried about something or behaving irrationally, it can present the opportunity to buy resilient businesses at very attractive valuations, including those companies we discussed today. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you can get an alert when the next episode goes live in a few weeks. For further information on Antipodes, head to our website, antipodes.com, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. The content in this podcast is general information only. It is not advice of any kind and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation, objectives or needs. You should seek professional advice before making any financial decisions. Stock commentary is illustrative only and not a recommendation to buy, hold or sell any security.